Todo el mundo. But that was really. 1881. Rock. Rockers, this is Stacy Lane Wilson, author and editor of the Rock and Roll Nightmares book series and director of the films The Ventures, Stars on Guitars, and The Second Age of Aquarius. Rock and Roll Nightmares, the podcast, explores the dark and mysterious and sometimes funny side of music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. But that's just a jumping off point. Think of it as a 45 record you bought for the hit you know and then going to the B-side and discovering something really cool and unexpected. On this lo-fi podcast for hi-fi people, I will be interviewing, sometimes by myself, sometimes with a co-host, musicians, authors, artists, and filmmakers. Enjoy! My guest today is Scott Sigler, a number one New York Times best-selling author and metal musician. His band is called Super Weapon, and he's got several book series, and he's written novelizations based on the Alien and Predator films. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's good that you're here. Um, I love the fact that you're a musician and a writer, and I feel like there's more crossover between music and writing than some people might expect. Um, but, you know, there are some horror author musicians who come yeah. to mind, you know, like Stephen King, he's in a hobby band. Um, Greg Kinn, uh, he's an 80s dude who became a prolific mm -hmm. novelist and wrote some horror. So uh, what came first for you? Was it writing fiction or playing music? I think they both, they, they've kind of come hand in hand through the years. So I, I'm very fortunate. I've known what I wanted to do with my life since I was in the third grade. And that was to be like Stephen King. I wanted to write like that. I loved his books and uh, and was super jealous of him way back when because of his band, The Rock Bottom Remainders. And every time they would go to a writing convention, he would get to get up, get to go on stage with like Anne Rice and a bunch of other super famous <laughs> authors. And they would just get to rock out at a convention. And even though they weren't pro musicians, you know, they would have like a 500 to a thousand people at their shows. <laughs> All the writers wanted to come out and see them play. So uh, I know it, it's been hand in hand with a lot of those people in that band for a while. Um, I did, I did not get a guitar uh, until I was in college though. Um, my parents were not, not, up on the idea of me being in rock bands, even though my dad is a huge ACDC fan. And um, I was listening to ACDC from just ever since I was a, a little kid. Oh, so the music, wow. the music came a little later. I was already hell bent for leather to, to be a writer and figure out a way to crack that code. And then when I get into college and started, got a bass and started playing in rock bands, the two have been hand in hand ever since then. And now they've, but they're completely merged with uh, my band super weapon because that is, that is a band that tells science fiction and horror stories within the realm of metal. I love that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So you mentioned your band super weapon. So um, who else is in the band? I mean, your guitarist really shreds. So uh, tell me a little right, bit about it. Right now, right now it is, uh, we have kind of a ad hoc drummer who's not really part of the band. So it's really just me and uh, Savvy. His full name is Severio Nawada. People call him Sevi and he's, he's got like a jazz degree and he's just this incredibly talented 
guitar player and he's uh, he's a big fan of 80s and 90s metal even though that predates him by quite a bit he's just got this encyclopedic knowledge of the genre he's a huge he's inspired by george lynch and zach wilde and a lot of and rat and a lot of other bands along those lines but he is a he, he's the primary writer of the music so he usually comes up with a the licks and the riffs we always start with those things and then we move into kind of collaborating chord progressions and then we move into uh, the story and the lyrics and melody that tends to fall more towards me. So at this point, it is just Sevi and I, we are still casting about for, uh, uh, we had a keyboardist and he recently left the band. So his name was Austin Farmer. He's a great dude. He's doing some other music projects. We're trying to find somebody with that big theatrical keyboard scope who wants to just, you know, be all over the place and make tons of tons of cool sounds. Wow. Well, if there are any cool musicians listening i'm going to play a little bit of one of your songs right now and then we'll come right back cool spartans what is your profession ooh, ooh, ooh.
and that was Battle Cry by Super Weapon. Uh, you have a new video out called Run, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, I watched it. I thought it was shot in this really fun sort of grindhouse, you know, film motif, and um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of what the Beastie Boys did with Sabotage, which was a lot of fun. Um, what was your inspiration to shoot your video that way? Well, the inspiration was kind of constrained by the budget. We wanted to keep things really down. All right, this is how much we're going to spend on this. What can we do within that context? And then we went through and we're all we're all from San Diego. So we wanted to shoot it in San Diego and get around the town. And then we found this uh, this awesome location, the 10th Avenue Arts Center in San Diego. And they were having um, a they were doing the Evil Dead, the musical. So oh, wow. that, I saw that. that. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> great. It's so great. That set was already in place. And they talked to the people putting on the production and they're like, well, as long as they don't burn anything, uh, then, yeah, you can use it. So they let us use that. <laughs> So we wrote a storyline around that and then just use whatever we had available. And of course, being a big fan of, you know, that Quentin Tarantino kind of approach to things, we just tried to take our storytelling from the songs themselves and try and expand that into a video. So we shot a bunch of it in black and white, and then we got to put on, you know, the butcher's coveralls and get everything incredibly bloody and have a great time all the way through the end of the song and, and get to watch Sevy Shred. So it's super fun. Let's listen to Run right now. What you want to do with it? He got a little pretty mouth, thing. he?
so much fun. Um, now you uh, perform as Mr. Merciless, your mm -hmm. alter ego, or <laughs> is it the other way around? That's a good question. I think it's possible it might be the other way around. I think that is a, <laughs> that is probably my more at home state uh, to be to be Mr. Merciless. And then you got to even though I'm a little bit a little bit out there and outlandish as far as authors go, you still got to dial stuff down so much to to operate in this business. And when you have to, you know, when you have to go talk to publishers and talk to the press, you can't be biting the heads off bats. It just doesn't work out. <laughs> no, publishers <laughs> don't like that, do they? No. When you show up to a meeting, biting the heads off. No, the bats. publishers do not like to be frightened by scary people. So, <laughs> uh, but really, Mr. Merciless kind of came out because we started to put this band together and Sevy and I had been in another band uh, before he's still in it. It's Evan Diamond in the library, another San Diego act. And she's an incredible vocalist, very, very talented songwriter, but it's much more singer songwriter oriented music. Uh, and Sevy and I are more, you know, straight up metalheads. So Sevy, uh, Sevy brought the idea, maybe we should do a metal band. And then I started to to rehearse with Sevy and started to see him play. And frankly, I got super intimidated. I was like, holy crap, I've never been in a band with somebody this good before. He is insane. So I kind of, <laughs> I kind of had to tap out and be like, I need to come up. I need to find some part of my personality that can be on stage with this, with this guy and not be, not just like hide in a corner. So Mr. Merciless kind of came to the fore and it fits, it fits really good. I don't know if that's a split personality thing, but when I <laughs> work on the music, I, I'm not the same person talking right now. I kind of become this different guy and I, it was a survival. It was, it was a survival tactic to, to be able to play in the band and not be, not have, and, and have enough confidence to deliver as a front man. Ah, I see. Kind of like an actor getting into costume yeah. or something like that. Okay, That's, that's yeah. totally it. Because I mean, I've, I've been in metal bands for a long time. I've been with a bunch of great players, but every now and then I'm sure out people out there who are in bands every now and then you wind up in a band with somebody like this person's just on a completely different level. Um, and yeah, so I kind of need to get in character to be up there and be an equal, you know, on stage and equal in writing the songs. Uh, and it's worked out pretty good so far. So do you find that a lot of your readers discover your music through your books or it just sort of the music career and the novel career don't? The, the readers really, the, the, the writing career sort of takes care of itself at this point. And I've always been, work, put a lot of time into re, outreach, having a website where there's a lot of activity, the fans that being active in social media. And when a reader tr reaches out to try and communicate to a creator, like, I love your stuff. Your stuff really matters to me. Trying to take that just a little bit of time to respond to that and say, thank you. That means a lot. I'm so glad to have you listening. Um, and that that's very much, you know, that's, that's the get in the van and tour rock and roll style of marketing. You know, after the show, you go to the bar and have drinks with anybody who wants to come up and talk to you about the show. People like the music, people like that sense of connection. So that's, that's always been a big part of it. What I have been surprised to find, and I shouldn't have been surprised by this, but it took, caught me off guard nonetheless, is just because people like a certain style of writing, and that's the writing I write, they don't necessarily like the same kind of music I do. So I've got you know, a lot of fans of singer-songwriters and country music and, and rap and classical and all these different musical genres that love my fiction, but when they hear the music, they're like, that's not really my jam. They don't really like it all that much. Huh. And there's a certain, there's a certain chunk in that Venn diagram, which just, you know, goes nuts. Like, I can't believe I like your books and you make this kind of music. I love this. But I had assumed since I'd, I've built a large audience with the books that I'd be able to translate most of that audience over to the music. Uh, it's been surprising to me, but that's just not the case. You get a percentage of them, but not everybody's into it. Well, forgive me if I, um, don't know the answer to this, but I, I've read a few of your books and, uh, you know, I love the alien and the predator ones and the mm -hmm. pandemic one, you know, those are great, but I'm um, looking over your body of work. I don't see anything that, uh, has a rock band in it or is centered around music. Is that something that you would like to do in the future? Write a, a novel about a band. That's, that's possible. I started one called the band and it's, it's horror. It's about, uh, you know, this band that was big in the eighties or nineties, something like that. And then they broke up and the, uh, the singer disappeared and they all kind of went their separate ways and grew up and got grown up lives. And then when the singer comes back, he drags the band back together. Um, and they find out that he's, uh, you know, he hasn't been missing. He's basically been in hell for a while and now he's back. 
and it's a supernatural it's it's meant to be really scary but i haven't progressed on that too much because i remember reading like interview with a vampire by ann rice back in the day and, and some other books that focused heavily on the music elements of the main characters like being in a band being in a singer being in the music industry and i always felt reading that it left a lot on the table like you're telling me about this this music or, or what an amazing singer this woman is or what a great performer this guy is but but there's no there's no cue or no anchor to dial you into that and the old the best you can hope for is like yeah he kind of had ozzy osbourne's voice you know and this other guy's on stage persona and like that that sort of gives you an idea but the missing connection of what the music actually sounds like is something i've never been able to crack as a writer so that's the biggest reason i haven't gone down that road ah i see well i love those kind of books um I love the Dave Scow uh, books, you know, the mm -hmm. and the John Skiff, the Splatterpunk rock yep. and roll uh, books. But yeah, I couldn't get into that big bestseller, da Daisy Jones and the Six. I did read it, but it just really fell flat for me. So I can see what you're saying. It's hard to find that fine line. Um, now I'm wondering, do you listen to music when you're writing a novel? Yeah, it's it's got. I've always listened to music. I'm horribly ADHD and was obviously when I was a kid, it was just as bad. And having music on while I did homework, particularly when I was writing, was a great way. I think it's just the sense of steadiness and the sense of rhythm that kind of calms you down a little bit and lets you let you access those parts of your brain you need to do the math and do the writing, et cetera. And then as I as I got older and my writing got more advanced, I had to scrap rap from that. I couldn't do rap because the lyrical density was so, so thick. And here I am trying to write all these words and then I'm listening to the thing with just as many words in it and all this, all these intricacies and all this rhyming. And I found like, okay, I can't pay attention to my writing when I'm listening to rap. So rap kind of had to get pushed to the wayside. And now over the past couple of years, it's that's happened as well with, with rock and with metal and just about everything else. So now I write a lot only to uh, instrumentals, and primarily just to classical music. So I've gone the gamut from being, you know, total metal head, like screw that classical music, it's a bunch of crap. <laughs> and now, now, like if I don't have some classical on when I'm writing, I am going to be distracted all over the place. But music's still a huge part of everything I do. To, to wrap up, I sometimes ask the obligatory question titled after this podcast, what is your rock and roll nightmare? What is my rock and roll nightmare? I, I I still have a little bit of a soft spot or weak spot for, you know, the Satanism, the devil imagery. When I was, I grew up in a very tiny town in Northern Michigan where, you know, nothing much had changed for a very long time. And it was, uh, it was kind of church dominated and in, in not, not being an advocate of religion myself, there still was this, this overhanging gestalt of of bad things waiting for you if you went the wrong way mm -hmm. so even even things now i look at as benign as like motley crew back in the day you know or dio you know i'm like those just just some of the some of the 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 song titles some of the lyrical content some of the album covers uh it scared me and i was like you know late late high school or college or whatever and that that stuff when i came across it it struck something inside me that was slightly slightly fearful tiny bit repulsive like like it's like a crawling spider don't don't go near that don't touch it just immediate reaction and the older i become that is almost non-existent but i would still say that the rock and roll nightmare part of it is is that that urge to want to do something in the creative arts so bad that you are willing to give up anything to get it the classic i sold my soul for rock and roll approach to things and that that still that parlays into some of my work and will parlay a lot into future work. But that's still that even though my logical brain says none of that exists, there's still a tiny bit of the soul that is afraid of that. So my rock and roll nightmare largely involves that kind of stuff. You know, somebody getting dragged off stage and <laughs> or or getting to have all the fame and stardom in the world for a relatively brief span of 15 years and then, you know, get to spend eternity in, in burning torment forever. That sounds quite frightening indeed. <laughs> so you brought up about, you know, what you're looking to the future. So um, what is next for you? What can we look forward to in books and music from you or any other projects? 
Well, a really exciting things. I got two Predator stories coming out this year. I'm a big fan of that French franchise. So Predator, Eyes of the Demon. I have a short story in there. That'll be out March. Uh, that'll be out in June 2022. March 1st, 2022. It's Aliens versus Predator Ultimate Prey, which is I had to write Aliens and Predators in the same story. And, and it being How fun. Big, <laughs> so fun. Being a big science fiction buff. Uh, I love it. And I was actually able to get permission to tie that in with the full length aliens novel or out called aliens phalanx. So that story is a continuation of that. So it's been a marvelous, marvelous time playing in those sandboxes. I love it right now. I'm working on finishing up book seven in my galactic football league series, which is a kind of very different hybrid. But the thing we're really pumped about is I'm getting back into straight horror. We just signed a five book deal for a series called the crypt. And that is military science fiction horror, um, whereas Battlestar Galactica has been described as an aircraft carrier in space. This series is more like a World War II submarine in space for Cthulhu's Navy. It's, it's going to be really dark and a lot of met- metaphysical stuff going on and extremely gory. And we're, we're super pumped to bring that out to everybody. Wow, sounds like you have a lot of research to do. So uh, I will, uh, yeah, so thank you, Scott. I really appreciate you joining me on the Rock and Roll Nightmares podcast. And um, we'll look for your future books and your music, of course. Great, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. As always, before I close the show, I'm going to share a paragraph from one of the Rock and Roll Nightmares books. This is an excerpt from Do You Fear Like We Do, the 1970s fiction edition. The story is Love Dies Bleeding, and it is by Dr. Oolong, seemingly. I was heading up to a remote cabin. It was Jeff's idea. He said it would put my head in the proper space to write some dark killer lyrics and tunes. Apparently, the songs I had been coming up with were not creepy enough. Ellis Cooper had some cool trippy stuff, but it was nowhere near as weird as the band Kill Me Groovy Baby. I'd never heard of Kill Me Groovy Baby before, but I thought the cover was bitchin'. 60s psychedelia flower power meets Groovy Ghoulies, a Saturday morning cartoon that I kind of dug but would never admit to anyone. The album was titled Songs to Die For. Lovely. I ejected Alice and popped in Songs to Die For. The paved road had ended a while back, and now I bounced and scraped along a rutted dirt road, checking Jeff's hand-drawn map and swearing a dark, belonged death upon him. The eight track clicked and changed tracks annoyingly right in the middle of their jaunty song, I'm Dead, Your Turn, which I found myself singing along to. Eight tracks are weird in the way they fade or cut out in the middle of songs to switch tracks. It's aggravating and stupid. I suggest you buy a cassette player for your car if you ever have the choice. Instead of I'm dead, your turn continuing, it jumps straight to a different track called You're Dead, My Turn. Kill Me Groovy Baby had a very limited imagination when it came to song titles. The song started off quietly enough, even prettily, but then it unsurprisingly took a darker turn. This concludes another episode of Rock and Roll Nightmares. I'm your host, Stacey Lane Wilson. The theme song, Out for Blood, is composed and sung by Lars with a Z, Cabot, and the band is Fuzzbuster. You can hear the whole track in the horror comedy film, Valentine Days, also with a Z. For photos of the guests and show archives, please visit the website rockandrollthings.com. That's rock and roll with an N. You can also join the Rock and Roll Nightmares Facebook group or follow us on Instagram at Rock and Roll Nightmares Books. That's B-O-O-K-S. This is an indie podcast, so your subscriptions and ratings are really important. Thank you for joining me. And until next time. <laughs>